You are listening to the Hostage to the Devil podcast. Some listeners may find this content disturbing. Hi, Michael, and thanks for coming on the podcast. Uh, it's an honor to be able to finally talk with you. Thank you so much for having me. Am I right in saying, did you contact me after seeing the film, or how is the how did we get in touch in the first place? Well, um, I, I was writing the book over COVID, and I was talking to my my girls. I have girls that are like thirty years old. Yeah, and uh, I was talking to them, and I was basically my my inclination to write the book was for the story for my kids and my grandkids, because, you know, nobody wants to talk about this stuff. You know, it's not something I sit down over dinner and talk about, you know, to my kids, but they all want to know, but they have young kids and uh, you know, they don't have, we don't have time to talk about this. It's not something you can say in five minutes. So I started writing the book for them. I can say, okay, this is what happened to your dad. Here you go. Um, As I was going through the process of it, um, my girls would ask me, so how's the writing coming along, dad, and stuff like this. And uh, I said, it's coming along good. And they would keep telling me, listen, you've got to, you've got to make this public because you have told us for so many, so many times that, you know, you wish you, someone would know what was going on with you. So, because I didn't really know that anything was wrong, <laughs> believe it or not. But uh, my girl said, you've got to do it for even if there's one person out there that may be going through the same thing. So yeah. I, I took that to heart. I took that to heart, but I still wasn't convinced because they were telling me, go public with it. And it, it wasn't till it wasn't. I was almost done. And then I happened to be at home. I had just finished a chapter and I put Netflix on and I found your documentary. I'm a guy who's into documentaries because documentaries, for the most part, they tell the truth. They're, uh, they're um, highly scrutinized and a lot of information and time goes into it. I don't like movies per se, because there's a lot of liberations going on in the movies. So, but uh, I love documentaries and I happened to find that. And once I had finished watching it, uh, the first thing I did was look up who the producer was and I saw your name and I said, you know what? I said to myself, I said, you know, I'm going to send this guy uh, a a message, probably won't get in contact with me, but regardless, (laughs) (laughs) you know, I'm going to send him a message because this guy sounds like a guy who, if I told him my story, he wouldn't be like, uh, you know, wow, what a freak or, you know, you're, you're telling a big lie to sell books or what have you. So getting in contact with you and having you, um, you know, uh, correspond with me was the final nail that helped me realize that I should go public. You are actually the very first person publicly that doesn't know me. And, yeah. you know, not a whole lot of people know my story, just a very immediate family and uh, a few other people. And that's it. But, you know, I was looking, I was really looking for, hey, you know, are people on the outside going to think, you know, just going to discount me off as some sort of crazy guy or seeking for attention or, or anything like that. So you were the first one and your response was, was very important to me. It was going to determine, you know, where I was going to go with the next step with this, whether I was going to make it public because I was on the fence about it at that time. Yeah. And uh, when I got a positive response from you, uh, I was like, and you know, I have to credit you for for giving me that, uh, you know, giving me some time, basically, to just kind of chat with you. And, you know, you said you wanted the book, you had some interest in, in, in reading it. And that was the first outsider, you were the first outsider that I was able to bounce this off of, and, and get, uh, you know, I'm not going to say it's a positive response, because, you know, people don't say, oh, great story. You know, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it was the first, hey, you're not crazy. Hey, you know, you, you took me for what it was because, you know, this isn't some sort of, you know, big lie to make you know, money selling yeah. books or anything like that. You know, I took I spent 40 years not talking about this until finally I was ready. And this is how it just came about. So that's kind of how we got together. You know, you put the nail in the coffin for me when I told my <laughs> wife. Yeah, I told my wife, listen, I've, I've talked to Martin a couple of the, 
He knows what he's talking about. He's 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 seen this guy. He's talked to people. He's looked in their eyes. You know, he he's he's done the research. You know, this is more than just a story. You have to do research to really dig and 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 uh, become knowledgeable about something. And that's exactly what I am. I'm a real detective about things. And uh, that's kind of what spurred the whole the whole process along. But I mean, plus the stories about your life as well and your own mother. So you've got to be very diligent with your research and your, you know, in, in the way you approach this book. And I'll be honest with you, I, I'm I'm I am a normal person. Like filmmakers and art actors and other people, they the general public put them on a pedestal. And I'm just, I'm really I'm just a normal down to earth guy. And I'll listen to anybody who has a story to tell. And yeah yours from the get-go was something that felt fresh in a subject matter that had been done a thousand times and yeah you came across really well and nice and uh, rather than keep talking about the book we'll go into that um in a few minutes but had you had you become aware of father martin's work before the documentary or did the documentary sort of um was that the first time you'd heard about the man well i had i had heard about them because uh, before before uh, the Netflix before your Netflix project came out, yeah. I had listened to all the Art Bell interviews um, with Malachi. You know, I think there was I don't know maybe fourteen hours worth. I mean, I listened to all those, and the reason why I listened to all those it wasn't specifically for for uh, Martin Malachi, but it was you know in during the four during my forties because I'm fifty three right now. Um, I began to study all of these exorcisms from the 13th century on. I, mm -hmm. I got every transcript. I got every video. I got every, uh, you know, tape, every audio recording and, and delved heavily into it to, to find, because like I said before, you know, I'm, I'm like a detective, you know, I put my mother's picture on a wall and then began to form a story around it by all these other, other exorcists, exorcisms and all this other information and begin to draw all the lines and the timelines and the characteristics. Because like I said before, you know, when we were growing up in this, we had no idea what it was. We had no idea what was going on because it was so gradual and so slow and it happened over so many years. Obviously the last six or seven years were extremely horrific. But still, I, I wasn't, I was so indoctrinated and so was my sister that, you know, we didn't go running to school, you know, hey, you got to, you got to see what's happening over at my house. That never entered my mind because it was such a gradual, slow thing. Even when it became extremely horrific, it wasn't something that was, that we talked about. We didn't even talk about it at home. It was <laughs> very, very strange. Can you give us the synopsis for for the audience? We, we keep we keep talking about sort of the book. Um, let's 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 tell a specific tell the audience now specifically what the book is about. Well, it it uh, it starts, you know, in my early childhood when I was three years old, and the whole book. And I don't mean it to be about my mother. It's really about me and surviving this. But my from the age of three. I, I received a traumatic experience by my mother. She dumped a pot of burning hot soup over my shoulder. And that was the beginning of it. And then in the next couple of years after that, you know, this is, we're talking 1970, 72, 73. She, she was telling us, and I was just, she wasn't telling me, but I was overhearing this, that she began to hear voices she began to hear thumping and scratching in the wall and all these various, uh, you know, uh, as we would say today, uh, paranormal activity. And this increased. And then by, I think, 1975 is when we moved from, we lived in uh, suburbia in Toronto. And then we moved to a rural town 120 miles away that was only 4,500 4, people. But my dad still worked in Toronto. So we moved all the way up there and then he had to drive all the way back down there. So we were completely isolated, no family. And from this moment on in 1975, no one ever came and seen us. No one ever came and visit us, save one time that my uh, you know, Italian family never even came in the house. But from then on is where my mother's escalation began. 
She, she not only began to hear voices, she began to talk. She began to whistle. She began to talk in different languages, uh, began to argue. Then she became extremely blasphemous and, and wicked and screaming. And it became horrific. By the time, by the time I was 16, she attempted murder of, on my sister. And then uh, they took her away in a, in a, in a straitjacket to the mental institution. And three months later, she was back. And she continued this same behavior. And then uh, she was taken away again after attacking me and my, and my father. And then they brought her back another three months later. And at that time, my sister had already left because she was seven years older than me. And, uh, and I made a beeline for California. I was living in uh, Ontario at the times. And as soon as I turned 18, I made plans to get out, you know, and to move to California. I actually came to California. I was 19 years old and living under the Santa Monica Pier. And that's basically the gist of the first book. And coming to find out over the next 30, you know, 40 years is that what I discovered was that she was incredibly de and completely demonically possessed. And, and now that I look over it and have studied for decades, now I see all the, I mean, it was horrific at the time. There was something definitely, uh, you know, she wasn't normal. You know, there were, there were you know, in incredible paranormal things going on, but we were never able to, you know, we lived in a small town. We were Italian. My father didn't speak English very well. He was never home, came home for a few hours on the weekend and then was gone. You know, it was just me and my sister. And she lived in, in her room uh, with the lock on her door. And even though I lived with her for eight years, I never barely saw her. She came out, grabbed food, went back in her room and locked the, locked the door. I never saw her. What was the reason for moving in 1975 to that rural area? Then what was the, what was the motivation to do that? I'm not really sure, but that's the odd thing is that we moved all the way up there and then he had to work all the way back down 120 miles away. I'm not really sure, but I think that there was some sort of dynamics with my mother and my um, mother's sister at the time, because I remember when I was very young, they were into seances and there might have been swinging and stuff going on, but something happened in the family dynamic. And my dad decided that he needed to get out of Dodge and, you know, we move 120 miles away, but yet he still has to drive all the way back down to Toronto. I, I still to this day don't know. What, would, what do you feel was, were the origins of this obsession and possession? Well, after talking to my sister, she filled in a few gaps for me because she's seven years older than me. She told me that before I was born, her father, who she adored, she absolutely adored the man. He was killed in a train accident um, in, in Toronto, in that area. Um, he was apparently he was drunk, stumbled onto a train track and the train came and cut his legs off and killed him. And uh, she was just horrified at that. And I, I think, and, and it's, this isn't, uh, this isn't um, you know, just coming up with some more idea of what happened because I remember being very young and you know, my parents and my, my aunt, who was my, you know, my mother's sister, they would talk about seances and I would hear them talk about this. I never even knew what the word meant. But I kept it in my head. And then years later, you know, I found out what it was and that it didn't still didn't mean anything to me. But I think that's what happened is, you know, back in those days in the in the late 60s and the early 70s, you know, seances and get it gathering around a table and trying to to, uh, you know, uh, elicit a response from dead loved ones and stuff like this was was really happening back then. Same with swinging, you know, and all that kind of thing. And I think that's what my mother did because I heard tales of my grandmother who, when she lost him, she, she loved him so much too. She couldn't handle it. She went out and party and left my mother, who was the eldest of three to take care of the kids. And she was devastated. She was absolutely devastated. And I think this is, this was the invitation. This was the opening here was that her and her sister began to do these seance things because I remember all through the years growing up them talking about seances um, 
uh, my aunt had a cousin that was my age, one year older than me. And we used to talk about our parents and ESP and, you know, things of that day, you know, in the, in the seventies. So I really think that that was the entry point right there. I really do believe it. So you're, you're, you're in a remote area. Your dad's hardly around. It's you and your sister and your mother, you know, can you t- talk, talk me through, you've just moved to this area, this new house. Talk me through the, the behavior and the, and, and the sort of disintegration of your, of your mother's health and also her, her erratic behavior gets intensified. Talk, talk me through those early, early stages and, and what you experienced as, as, as a young boy. Right. Well, in 1975 is when we moved up there. It was my first year in kindergarten. And from then, right from then, when we moved up there, um, she was, you know, just talking to herself, you know, you know, walking around the house, talking to herself. And, you know, that wasn't, you know, that wasn't uncommon. It was kind of weird, you know, but it increased every year to her talking to herself and not even aware that we're there. Hmm. And then after, you know, probably by 1979, 1980, her conversations were full blown conversations, talking to multiple people. And then maybe around 1980, 1981, it got into, it got into, uh, you know, talking with multiple people and then her voice is changing. You know, and I mean, we're talking about a woman here that's she was 4'11". And by that time, you know, she had very short vocal cords. So she had a very high voice and she was emitting these guttural manly tones out of her from these voices. And they would change on on a dime, you know, like one ask one ask a question and the other, you know, say something or respond back and just multiple many, many different different voices and then it grew into not only were the many voices then it became angry extremely violent and then it became uh, well it didn't it didn't just become but it, it it escalated to languages i mean i was having a hard time understanding anything she said because i didn't understand what she was saying and you know at, at that point i'm just a kid and you know we're all kind of just you know, ah, she's crazy, you know, and we're not discounting. But I'll tell you, that had enough, such an effect on me that uh, today, as a 53-year-old, you know, I speak almost five languages that I learned on my own because I hated being in the dark and not understanding what she was saying. And that had an effect on me later on in life that I couldn't stand it when people would, would, would uh, talk like that. It was... Uh, it was a post-traumatic stress for me that not being able to understand what somebody was saying. So I started learning languages and I just, I didn't go to school or anything. I learned them by myself and it got so bad that not only was she doing these, you know, speaking in different languages and these guttural tones and laughing hysterically, whistling, whistling, you know, for hours on end, this, this, this activity, this behavior went on from sunset to sundown. And by 1980, 1982, she was hitting herself with a log. And she was just whacking herself in the chest with a log while she was having these conversations. And it never ended. I, you know, I would leave in the morning because I couldn't handle the stress of being there. I would leave at like 7:30 in the morning you know, uh, and take off and go up the river and come back at sunset. And I would be parking my bike outside and, you know, we'd have all the windows open and I'd park my bike and I could hear the thudding from outside. And I'm, I would walk inside and she's still hitting herself in the chest. Her chest is beat red and she's just whacking herself with this, with this log. And then sometimes, you know, she'd have a boot in the other hand and she'd be whacking herself on the head with a boot. And the, the, the crazy thing about it was she would do this behavior and, you know, I would be standing in the room and it was like, I wasn't even there. In fact, there were times where I think I was around 16 years old at the time. I had become so distressed by her behavior that I would go right up to her face, almost touching noses and scream obscenities in her face to stop. And she wouldn't even react. 
She wouldn't even break out of these voices. There was a couple of times where she did. She just stopped for a minute and stared at me directly into my eyes, you know, and just stared at me and it freaked me out and I backed off. And then one split second later, boom, she was right back into it. It just never ended. It never ended. And then when, when the sun went down, that's where she would retreat from her chair that she always sat in by, which I have to mention by that time, she must've weighed 260 pounds and she bottomed out the chair. And she was eating like a ravenous animal. I mean, anything that was in the house, she was eating. And she had been doing this for years, like a, like a ravenous animal. So much so that, uh, you know, when I was a kid, I grew up stealing lunches at school. I grew up um, in the summer times, obviously, because this was Canada. I stole vegetables out of the garden. And that had an impact on me because I'm a vegetarian to this day. Because I stole and ate so many vegetables. I'd pick, you know, vegetables out of this guy's garden that was attached to our backyard. Because back in those days, we didn't have fences in Canada. Everybody's backyard was just one big conglomerate of green grass. And he had this massive garden. And I, when I was hungry, I'd go out there, steal carrots, celery, take them down to the creek, wash them off and eat them. And I did that for maybe a decade, you know. And it got so bad that she was, you know, eating everything in the house that my dad had to take what food we did have when he was there. He would put it down in this big, huge freezer. Back in the seventies, we had these freezers that were, you know, you could stuff a body in. They were big. And my dad put a big heavy chain on it and a lock because she was literally eating us out of, of house and home. She had no teeth in her head. The teeth that she did have were all broken and she would wag her tongue at me you know, just out of nowhere, whether she was doing it to me or not, I'm not quite sure, but you could see she'd stick her tongue out so far. You could see that, that the, the sides of her tongue were so serrated like a knife because her teeth were all broken. And of course they were getting chewed up, you know, by her tongue bleed and then heal. So you'd have these bumps kind of like when you get a canker sore and her tongue was just this grotesque you know, appendage that she would stick out and wave, you know, back and forth, kind of like Gene Simmons from Kiss, you know, except from side to side, you know. As a small child, did you, what was going through your head? But what did you think your mom, did you think your mom just lost her, you know, lost the marbles or what, what was going through your head as a, as a young boy and your sister's head, you know, was there any support? Did the church get involved? Did any psychiatrists get involved at this stage? What, what, what sort of, what was going through your head and what was the support for you and your sister at the time? Well, there was nothing going through my head. I had no idea what was going on. And, you know, like I said before, I wouldn't run to school and say, tell my friends, oh, you should see what's happening at my, it was completely normal for me because we grew up in this. It was slow. It was methodical and it was 12 plus years. So my sister and I, we still don't talk about it to this day. My sister's in complete denial over it. And as far as any religi uh, you know, religiosity or any, uh, anybody coming into the picture, you know, as far as uh, you know, Catholics or Christianity, and any, there was no one except that my mother had become a Jehovah's Witness before we moved to Meaford. And then when we moved to Meaford, both her and my father were excommunicated. My mother, I don't know why. But my father, this was in the early days, 75, 76, and 77. By 77, she was excommunicated because I remember having to miss the Muppet show <laughs> to go to the Kingdom Hall on a Wednesday night, which, which just irked me. But um, for my father, they were saying that he was, uh, you know, back then there was, you had the pizza connection. And my father was apparently... Um, involved in the mafia. He ran with Luciano Pavarotti and his brother. And, uh, you know, my dad would take me down to these, uh, these places in Toronto where, you know, you walk in and it's the same guys there every night after night after night, and they don't sell anything. If you know what I mean? <laughs> you know? And uh, yeah. So, you know, my sister, yeah, I mean, that sounds way. like, that sounds like another, another story in the making that one, another, another book. In the yes. Making. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It was very strange, very strange, but we were an extremely disconnected family. We never talked. 
my father. In fact, it wasn't till a couple of months ago that my dad asked me something. And I said to him, I said, pop, you know, I've been blacking out. I said, I don't know if you know this, but you know, over the last year, I blacked out like 12 times. I says, this is just something. And he was like, what? And I said, yeah. And he says, well, what's a cause from? And I said, dad, come on, mom. And he, Mm. he couldn't say anything. He just you know, he's, he's, he's like, he sounds like he's like compartmentalized it all and shoved, yeah. it, shoved it very deep well, into his um, consciousness. Yeah. Well, he grew up in World War II. He was uh, like yeah. five years old during the war. And then after the war, he spent uh, four years in Sabaudia, which was a refugee camp. And then he lived in general housing made by the government with him and his six brothers yeah. in a small apartment. So he didn't have life very good either, you know. So that his, he has post-traumatic stress as well. And he's not able to see, this was the thing. It's like a perfect storm. You know, the father, people always ask me, where was your dad during this? Yeah. And I said, my dad was absent. And for one thing, he doesn't speak English that well because he's from Italy, yeah. you know? And the, the other thing was, is that he's, you know, traumatically, he has post-traumatic stress from the war. Yeah. You know, he saw, he saw the Germans shooting at his dad running across the field bombs went off while they were hiding his donkey blew up and all the guts went on him and the kids you know his other brothers and sisters i mean stuff like that you know so he's just disconnected so talk us through the final moments then talk us through the last chapters in the story yeah well i had uh i had saved up money and i had planned a year in advance to go to california and uh apparently you know i had i had four other guys that were supposed to go with me but as the time drew closer, they all bailed until every one of them bailed except for me. Uh, The last week before I was going, this was in April, uh, I actually arrived in California on the day after Easter in 1987. That week before, my father had already sold the house, got my mother an apartment in another city about a half an hour away. He said, do you want to see your mother before uh, before you take off? he knew I wasn't coming back. And uh, I said, I said, sure, I'll, I'll go say bye. So I went up to the apartment, you know, it was above a store on Main Street. And, uh, you know, big, big, long, tall staircase. I went up to the top, knocked on the door, she opened the door, she didn't even look at me, she turned around and walked away. And I just walked in. She didn't even look at me. She didn't even know who it was. Uh, I followed her into the bedroom. She sat down on her bed. She, uh, she reached over uh, to the nightstand. She grabbed an envelope out of it. She handed it to me. And then she lay back down on the bed. And then, boom, here came all the voices. And she was talking. And, and I was like, at that point, I was like, I, I bloody had it. I've had it. I took the envelope. I didn't even say bye, I don't think. I just walked out the door. And, uh, you know, a week later, a week later, I got on. I got on the bus. Um, I had first tried to get a plane ticket over, but the uh, U.S. immigration stopped me because they went, "Hey, you know, you got a thousand bucks in your pocket. Here's a guy with long hair, musician." <laughs> and they went, "No way!" And they yanked all my gear off the plane. So I had to figure another way of getting across the border. So I went down to my sisters in Toronto and I said, "Can you drive me over the border in uh, um, St. Catharines, which is Niagara Falls?" Uh, into a Buffalo, New York there. So they drove me over, you know, and uh, I got on a bus, came out to California. I think it took three days. I slept on the Santa Monica Pier. That's a whole nother story. I was scammed by druggies and (laughs) I was in Death Wish 4 and I didn't even know it. And uh, (laughs) in the movie Death Wish 4. Yeah, I think you've you've got at least six parts to this. uh, um, You've got an anthology here of stories. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> yes yeah uh, uh, that is in the book too which is out now that i already already finished Great. and then uh, i had uh, stayed a few days with my cousin who lived in upland california which was you know about an hour and a half away from la and uh i i t- i gave them a number i had met this girl and i gave them a number where they could reach me if there was anything for any reason about two weeks later um they gave me a call and they said hey listen um sorry to inform you, but your mother died. And I was like, really? And they said, yeah, she, she died. And uh, I said, the only reason why they found her is that she was decomposing in her apartment building. And, you know, the stench was wafting over to other units. 
and they had called the police and uh, that's when they found her. And the coroner said that uh, it looks like uh, from the decomposition that she had been dead for X amount of days. And uh, they said she probably died on this day. And that was Easter weekend. And the Easter weekend was the day that I left uh, for California. So she ended up dying on the day that I left. It was a kind of, uh, you know, washing and wringing of the hands, you know, the mission's over, yeah. you know, she was 46 years old, 46 years old. She had no gray hair, but she was, uh, she was a mess. She, her, all her teeth were all in pieces. And, and, what, and what was the cause of death, uh, cause of death, sorry, on the, on the. Well, they document. said, uh, they said uh, it was atherosclerosis. So she had eaten herself to death. She gave herself a blood clot and uh, it killed her. And it was because of her diet. And that's what I was saying. I was saying she was, she was eating ravenously. She, she was like 4'11". And I think the last time I saw her, she was 260 pounds. I mean, she was as wide as she was tall. And, you know, my mother wasn't like that. You know, you see the pictures. I don't know if, if you know, if I sent you the book that had the pictures in it, that had uh, the pictures from her wedding and from uh, that Christmas mm -hmm. in 57 and 58, you know, she was thin. But, uh, you know, once this thing happened, and that's what my sister said is that, uh, you know, once this thing happened in Toronto, where she started saying she was hearing voices, this is where she just completely lost it. I mean, if I, you know, I did research on a lot of stuff, and it was kind of like the reverse of the Annalise Michelle case, if you know that one in Bavaria, yeah. 1975. <laughs> you know, a lot, of, a lot of hellish things happened in the, the mid-70s, interestingly enough. But uh, she died the opposite. You know, she she ate herself to death. And, you know, the funny thing is, is that she probably had diabetes because I would see her, you know, rubbing her feet together and she would lift up her leg as high as she could and then, and then dead drop it. And she would do that all day. All these compulsive, these erratic compulsive behaviors all day long for like 14 hours until the sun went down. And uh, and so that's eventually what she died, what she died of. And I was. Uh, I was not shocked at all because, you know, her eating habits were atrocious. You know, she ate everything to the fact, to the point where us kids, we didn't have food. We never had food growing up. You know, I mean, I was, I was catching fish down at the local river, coming home and, and cooking it right away and eating it before anyone else got a chance because I knew that it, it would be gone. You know, I only had one chance and I have that eating disorder to this day where I inhale and my wife always tells me, slow down, inhale. Yeah. Yeah. But I've had, you know, so many, I was conditioned to do that from a small child was that, you know, when I had food, now was the time to eat as much of it as you can, because it won't be here later on, you know, and that's what I did. And I've, in, you know, I inhale my food, it's terrible digestion, but I still do that to this day, you know, some 40 years later. And you say your dad's still alive. Is that correct? I, my dad is still alive. He's uh, 88 years old. He still lives in the Toronto area. He moved from Meaford about and back down to you know another hundred miles away where he used to live, and he's still there. And we never talk about it. I mean, we have a better relationship now. We didn't talk for years, and uh, we never talked growing up either. But uh, he. Do you think he holds a lot of a lot of obviously unanswered questions that you have and your sister has? Do you think he holds a lot of keys to for you for you both finding some sort of resolution with 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 your mother and her story? Do you, do you think she's do you, do you feel like he's he's hiding something or holding on to something? No, no. My dad is about as clued out as you can possibly possibly get, and I don't say that in a in a in an educational way. I mean, he only yeah. has a fourth grade education because of World War II, but he's just was is was extremely disconnected he yeah. was all about him himself doing what he had to do and nothing else mattered i mean i wore i wore girls clothes because he know he didn't provide for us you know he we grew up like we were in the war with him we didn't yeah. turn the heat on you know we didn't turn the lights on you know until it was absolutely you know he even turned the heat off in winter and in canada you know we had to heat yeah. our our stove you get minus 70 degrees I mean, it's bloody cold and we just had a, a wood stove and he 
well, it's, you know, I chopped the wood for a living <laughs> basically as a kid. So, you know, all I can say about him is he was just a completely disconnected, no emotional contact with his children, with his wife or with himself for that matter. It just, yeah. you know, and I, I accredit that to his post traumatic stress from the war. And yeah. we've talked a little bit about it and I've forgiven him for it too, because I have post traumatic stress so bad that, uh, you know, I shake at nighttime. I have to be medicated at night or I'll pass out. That's just what happens to me. That's been happening to me for a very, very long time. Have you seeked help about your sort of blackouts and your anxiety and post-traumatic stress? Oh, have, have you spoken to anybody about this? Oh, yeah. I've been to psychiatrists. I've been to a number of them over decades. And they were like, uh, a lot of them just said, I can't help you. I, I'm yeah. not familiar with this. This is above my head. And I got referred. I think the last one I went uh, to, they referred me to a, a POW psychologist. Okay. who was dealing with guys that, uh, you know, killed children and women in Vietnam. And uh, at that point, because they were telling me, you know, this is the only trauma I can even think of that can relate to what you went through, you yeah. know, 12 plus years, you know. So, uh, yeah, it was a dead end road. Is your mom's sister alive or is she passed on now? No, she's still alive. And I've been trying to contact her, but I haven't been able to, I haven't been able to get through. I talked to. Uh, another aunt of mine because um, my mother had an aunt had a sister and a brother and the brother was the youngest and I've talked to him and his wife and they won't give me her phone number for some reason I've called and you know everybody's just so disconnected so I really think that there was a dynamic uh, back in the early days in the 70s that uh, I think there was you know and this is a conjecture for the most part on my part, but I yeah. will say, I think there was swinging and stuff that destroyed the family, yeah. you know? So okay. when your mother passed away, whatever was sort of tormenting her passed on with her or was it attached to your mother? Do you believe, or, or do, you, do you feel like it, anything has passed on to yourself or your sister or have you have any sort of paranormal effects from it? Like post your mom passing away? Um, lots. In fact, um, well, my sister, you know, she is in denial and I can't, I can't really speak on her part, but um, she just closed up like a clam. As for me, um, you know, a lot of people ask me, you know, so, uh, you know, when your mom died, you must have felt relief, like it was all over. That was just the beginning. I yeah. had no idea, but I had insomnia for probably 18 years. I still have the blackouts. Um, I found out that, you know, by 19, you know, when I'd come to California and started to live a life on my own, that I didn't know how to do life. I didn't know how to do life. I was socially inept. I didn't go through puberty until I was 21 because my chemistry was so, so, so suppressed from the, uh, from the trauma. You know, I mean, I was a child living in an adult world, you know, and it took me a long time to sort of assimilate. I couldn't talk on the phone. I couldn't like this, this interview would have been absolutely impossible. Yeah. You know, absolutely. And, you know, it's taken a long time, but uh, you know, I'm finally able to, like I said, over the 40 years, it wasn't until that I realized what had happened because we were all in the dark, you know, back then we didn't talk about it. And then after it happened and it was over, we still didn't talk about it. And then 40 years went by. I had to figure out what, why I was a mess because it took me decades to figure out that, you know, by the time I was in lockdown in, in your Belinda for suicide, you know, some, I realized something's wrong with me. You know, I don't, I don't understand how to do life. I'm backwards. I do everything backwards compared to everybody else. I put my shirts on backwards. You know, I, I have a, you know, some a mild dyslexia. I write things backwards. You know, it's been very traumatic and, you know, I've, I've been able just to do the best I can, you know, but my sister, she's completely clammed up and my dad, you just completely clued out. Do you think you need spiritual help or do you think you need um, psychological help moving forward? Well, when I was in my twenties, when I was in my twenties and I started having kids that's when I had a mental breakdown because now I knew, oh my gosh, I have a child, my yeah. first daughter and you know, the pressures of life, 
you know, then came upon me like, oh my gosh, I, I'm not equipped for this. Yeah. I ended up going to the doctor when I was 23 and they told me I had what's called young man's disease. Okay. <laughs> it, it was, it was, yeah. I was like, whatever. They said it was an anxiety <laughs> about tr- having a family and trying to get ahead, but that's really wasn't what it was. I had post-traumatic stress. So if only, if only they knew. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And we never talked about those things. You know, they asked about my, you know, about my uh, background and stuff. And I said, you know, just, you know, it's fine. I grew up and here I am, you know, it <laughs> never was, really became yeah. an issue, you know, until I started, I started, you know, it wasn't until I was locked down at Lord, uh, Yorba Linda and I had a guy try to kill me in the, in suicide watch in there. And, it, and then that's when I said, I had a, I had a, a moment while I was lying in bed, I was lying in bed at this lockdown unit and something, some dark figure came over and was whispering in my ear. Uh, it was saying a word and I didn't, I didn't understand the word, but I remembered it in my head. And um, it wasn't until years after that, that I looked up the, the word and it meant death in German. And uh, you know, it was calling my name and saying this, saying this word over and over and over and over. And uh, that was where I said, something's wrong with me. I, I, I had not yet, attributed any spiritual nature to anything as of yet yeah it wasn't until i had the breakdown and then what happened after that was uh, my wife and i we separated because i was losing my mind we separated then i found out she was pregnant and then i really lost my mind and i'll just tell you this is this is my testimony i was i gave her everything i had uh I had a brand new truck. I gave her the truck. I was feeling, I had so much guilt. I had $7 a week to live on. And uh, I was working at Sebastian hair care products at the time. And there was a lady there who was taking care of me by giving me the food from every um, a public relations event they had. Cause you know, there was like 600 employees and they, they, she would bring me the food. She happened to be um, Vinnie Vincent's wife from kiss the band kiss. It was her husband. He was the guitar player for Kiss. And she would give me food all the time. So I, I was losing my mind at that point. I got on a bus. I was going to see her. I was living about uh, 45 minutes away. I was on a bus going down Ventura Boulevard in front of Taft High School. People that live in California know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, right before the in and out Burger and you're going down the hill. And right there in front of, I think there was 40 people, 40 plus people on the bus. I looked up into the heavens and I said, I said, God, whoever you are, I've made a mess of my life. I need you. I'm surrendering to whoever you are. I need your help. I'm losing my mind. I've, I've, I've lost everything and I don't know what to do. And I began crying on the bus. I was talking out loud. I was crying profusely in front of all these people. And at that minute, I'm not going to say I heard a voice because I didn't hear a voice, but all of a sudden I had this hum- humongous peace come, up, come upon me. And I, I, I dried my eyes and I got to the, the bus stop and I was seeing the world now for what it was, this dirty, uh, this dirty place where people were running about you know, uh, for personal gain and all the things that, that life we don't see that we don't want to see. Yeah. It's like this veil was pulled away from my eyes. Anyway, when I got off the bus, I ran as fast as I could down the street to where my wife lived. I knocked on the door. She opened up the door. I said, you know, she opened the door, you know, she knew I was coming. So she opened the door and I said, I said, everything's going to be okay. Everything's going to be okay. I said, sat down on the couch. She sat down on the couch with me. She looked at me like I had just lost my mind. And I said, I don't know what happened to me. I don't know what happened to me, but things are going to be okay. Let's get back together. Let's do this right. This child needs a a mother and a father. And I said, I do love you. I, I guess I just didn't know what I want. I don't think you knew what you want. I said, if you're willing to do this, let's do this. So, um, at that point I had no idea what had happened to me, but it didn't go away. The next day and the next week, I was so filled with this. I, I'm, I'm not the same person. 
And I was thinking, what happened to me? So what I did was I, I rented uh, Franco Zeffirelli's Jesus of Nazareth. You know, it's like eight hour, it's an eight hour epilogue, you know? So I, I put in the first tape and I was watching the tapes and, you know, my wife was watching it with me. And then there's a part where Jesus said, my sheep who know me, they hear my voice. And I looked at my wife with my eyes agaze. And I said, that's who I met on the bus. That is who I met on the bus. And she looked at me like I was insane. And I said, that is who I met on the bus. That is who spoke to me. Though I didn't hear an audible voice, that's who spoke to my soul. So from that point, I said, you know what? I got to go to church. We got to go to church. And she was like, okay. <laughs> so I happened to go to this church. I don't know how I ended up. Oh, I think a friend of mine said, oh, you got to try this church out in Simi Valley. I went to this church in Simi Valley. I'm sitting there. And the pastor says, the pastor says, and this is what it means to be born again. That Jesus said to Nicodemus, oh, don't, don't worry about, you know, how can you go back into your mother's room? That's not what it's about. It's being born again of the spirit. And all that know me that hear my voice and respond shall be born of the spirit. And I looked over at my wife and I told her, that's what happened to me. I've been born again. Whatever that is, that's what happened to me. Anyway, to make a long story short, everybody in the family, because, you know, we got get togethers, barbecues and stuff like this. And the extended family was maybe, I don't know, 25 people, 25 people, all the brother-in-laws and sister-in-laws and kids and so what have you. Um, they all looked at me like I was Charles Manson <laughs> within, within one month, my wife gave her heart to the Lord on the bathroom floor crying because she couldn't deal with the person that I had become. There was nothing about me that was the same. Yeah. And then in the next 20 years, 25 more people in my family became Christians, became born again, Christians. And that wasn't from me preaching to them, it, you know, because I didn't know nothing. It was from them seeing what had happened to me because they knew that I was so messed up. And then all of a sudden I had this incredible stability in my mind, in my soul, in my work, everything that I did. I mean, I still have the scars, which are the passing out. I can't deal with, um, you know, I can't deal with, uh, um, you know, large crowds. Uh, loud sounds that aren't me because <laughs> I'm a musician. I, I can't deal with any of that kind of stuff. You know, I remove myself from all of it. You know, and the blackouts, of course. Um, you know, I'm on medication, of course, because if I don't take the medication, I black out. And, you know, my grandchildren want their grandfather, you know, around and I want to be here. So that is basically the story in a nutshell as, uh, as far as the psychiatrist did nothing for me. They did nothing. And I saw psychiatrists for maybe 20 years, several different ones. You know, it wasn't till that time on the bus that I quote unquote became born again, that everything made sense. Then the spiritual realm made sense. Then I knew what happened. Then I began searching the scriptures, began searching all these, uh, you know, um, exorcist transcripts and everything. Then I discovered what was going on because yeah. it's hard to see. It's hard to see the spiritual when you're an unspiritual person. Yeah. You know, everything's mental illness. As, as you mentioned before, once that veil comes off, you can't, you can't put it back on. If you, you can't unsee, you can't unsee what you've been shown. So it can also be quite an intimidating time in your life where do I want to go back to the way I was? Not really, no, but it's it's just gets quite overwhelming because you can't go back, you can't unsee it. And there's no way of going back and putting that veil back on. It, once that comes off, once you see from a spiritual point of view, spirituality point of view, there's no going back. And it's, it's a beautiful ride. It's a beautiful journey, but it's also quite intimidating at the same time. Yeah, it was. Uh, it made everything make sense. The demonic, the spiritual realm, yeah. um, our, our spirits, what we're doing here. What was the cause of that? Why? I, my mom would have been see now I know after much research that uh, the entities that were because there's never one entity no. there's never one entity there's always many um, the entities that dwelt in my mother by her nonetheless you know their quest was not to destroy her it was to destroy me 
I was the target. I was the target because I'm the one that that they knew later on would profess Christ and bring all of these people in my family, you know, to the foot of the cross, as well as, and I, in fact, I have a ministry today. I Absolutely. have a ministry today that I talk to people and I help people understand. I mean, I get calls from people dealing with the paranormal and stuff. You know, I look at these guys on TV and all these paranormal shows, and I've had, I've talked to many of them. I've talked to the Josh Gates and the Dave Schraders and Ghost Hunters and all these guys. And all these guys, they got it all wrong. They have no idea what they're talking about. They have no idea what they're dealing with. They're not dealing with spirits of some dead girl who died in the 1800s and left a toy on the bed, you know, as a reminder. They have no clue that they're, they're dealing with demonic spirits that want their destruction. And they want that invitation to come in so that they can destroy their lives. I mean, you can go online and research a lot of these paranormal guys. You'll find out that some of them have actually murdered and are in jail because they don't know what they're talking about. And they're delving, they're delving into an area of life that they don't have protection from. They don't understand. You got you to understand one thing is the first thing, it's entertainment. You know, they're being paid yeah. to do this. Yeah. And you can't take that. I think a lot of people that watch these things, they don't, they don't understand that perception, even though they know it is, but they don't really think about it. And, and, and uh, it doesn't occupy their mind by what they're actually doing and saying, because it's entertainment. And yeah. the other part of it is, is they don't know what they're talking about. I mean, I could put all of these guys out of business by being yeah. on their show and coming in and scaring all these entities away. Because, you know, for one thing, they're inviting them and speaking with them. You know, the Bible tells us you're not supposed to, in the Old Testament, you were stoned for trying to communicate. It was, if God prohibited speaking to, to uh, entities, then how bad must it be? You know what I mean? And here are these, you got these guys running amok with all these silly EVPs and stuff talking to you and you get some garbled message, blah, 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 blah. And then they go, oh yeah, he said, get out of here or I'll kill you. Yeah. Who am I talking to? Oh, is it James? James. My, my favorite one is the photograph with the yellow circle around it. You know, you know yes. they're, trying to, they're, they're trying to get your, your attention to the, this area of the photograph and they put a big yellow circle around it. I'm like, I still have no idea what you're trying to, yes. you know. Get me to look out here. It's, it's, uh, yes. well, let, let's, uh, I mean, Michael, I could talk to you all night. You're such a great talker. And from someone who was, you know, I, I, as you mentioned before, someone who didn't really have friends growing up and didn't really socialize, it, I, could, I could listen to you all night, mate. And uh, I just want to say thank you. And it takes courage to write a story about your own life, in, including your own family members. So, you know, I, I respect you for that. And uh, I'd, lo I'd love to see your story on the big screen sometimes. And, and I'm sure, you know, with, with, with a few of our mutual friends and anyone listening to this, you know, um, I would love I would love to sort of see this story on the big screen, mate. Before we leave, can you guide people to where they can find your book and what is what, what is your book called and where can they find it? Well, right now it's only available on um, uh, net or not Netflix, Amazon, <laughs> Amazon Kindle, and it's Amazon. So if you have Amazon Kindle, Amazon Prime, or Amazon Unlimited, uh, Kindle Unlimited, you'll actually get it for free. But both books are now up there. Um, I'm currently writing a third and a fourth book right now. The third book is just uh, my humor as a kid growing up. Uh, you know, it's a it's a 180 degree turn. It's about the fun things I did when I was a kid, all the great laughs I had in school and just being a class clown. And it's really a diversion from all of this yuck. And then I got a fourth book I'm, I'm working on, which is called The Fallen Memoirs, which is where I'm taking the things that my mother said and actually incorporating them into a dialogue of demonic entities as they travel through the earth looking for, you know, suspects to inhabit. And uh, that's coming from a very, very, it's coming from their perspective. It's going to be very heavy. That's an interesting POV as well. Um, okay, tell us the name of your first two books. Uh, it's Devil Take the Hindmost, a, a story of terror, a true story of terror. And then it's Devil Take the Hindmost Part Two, The Aftermath, which, you know, encompasses from the, you know, 19 years old, sleeping under the pier, to 53 to talking with marty stalker today <laughs> ah, brilliant we're gonna leave it there if you're listening to this 
I'll put links in the podcast description, but yeah, go and download the book. And it's a fascinating read and a really interesting sort of point of view with regards to the whole world of demonic. Uh, Yeah, it's been refreshing to talk to you, Michael. And like I said before, thank you. And a lot of respect for you to put finally put pen to paper and I'm, I'm glad i was um, some sort of <laughs> influence in that decision but um, obviously we'll keep in touch anyway thank you marty really appreciate it it's been an honor all right michael see you soon mate good luck okay bro thank see you soon, mate. mate bye-bye bye-bye, bye-bye. bye-bye. Thanks for listening to our podcast and remember about our facebook page where you can find out more information about our documentary if you have some spare cash then please buy us a coffee over at buymeacoffee.com forward slash httd podcast to help us keep this podcast going and it would only be right to finish with the main man himself. Luciferian tradition is a very disturbing thing, and most people, Catholics included, and most bishops, and we have 4,700 bishops now in the UK in the Catholic Church, most of them don't want to talk about it, don't want to reflect on it. It's a very disturbing fact. And um, the, the, the fact is that demonic possession has increased. Why well, started doing anything in exorcism about 1970, of this century, and uh, since then, the incidence of possession and obsession, demonic possession and demonic obsession, has increased about 740 to 800 percent. The phenomenon has changed. We are now facing groups of 20-somethings or 30-somethings coming to us and saying, look, I made a pact with, with the, the devil, with Satan, with Lucifer, whatever they, however they use it, because I wanted a job, I wanted this woman, I wanted a career, I wanted the money, and they, I got it all, and now he won't let me go. Please help me.